I'm here with John Jett and Samantha Burt, two former SeaWorld trainers. We're at the Longboat Key Beach Resort in Sarasota, Florida, where we just attended Blackfish opening night a couple nights ago. And, and here, uh, Samantha Burt is going to ask John Jett some questions about the issue of uh, marine mammals in captivity. So before we start, John, I just want to know, what are you doing now? I'm a uh, professor at a private university called Stetson University. And what's your title? I am a vis visiting research professor. Great. And so how long did you work at SeaWorld? I worked there a little under five years. And um, do you know anything about animal rights laws in America, the difference between some of the laws that are in place in America versus in Canada? Is that anything that you know something about? I, I know very little about the differences in, in the, the prospective laws. Have you heard anything about what's been going on at Marineland with uh, Phil Demers and his, and his girlfriend, Christine, what's been going on with those lawsuits? Sure. I mean, it sounds like uh, you know a, a, a company trying to bully a couple of um, people that uh, have spoken out on behalf of the animals, and um, it, it's uh, predictable behavior, and it's unfortunate. What about there's a, there's one orca at uh, at Marine Land called Kiska. Do you know anything about her situation? She's been by herself for a long time now. Do you know anything about that? That particular issue? Well, I've read about it uh, a little bit. I know that's part of the, the, the gripe of the, the trainers that are coming forward. And, um, you know, it's a tragic set situation, obviously, when you have orcas that are um, very social by nature, that live in family groups uh, that are now, you know, listing in a tank uh, by themselves. Lolita is another example of um, a tragic situation where an animal's by herself. Um, so I know what I've read. I've never been to this particular park, um, but it sounds pretty tragic. Yeah, the isolation is a pretty serious issue. To have a lone killer whale just doesn't make sense given what we know about them in the wild, right? It doesn't make sense to me, um, but you know, this is, uh, this is not about, unfortunately, not about uh, animals or what's best for the animals. It's about profitability. And uh, unfortunately for the marine park industry, uh, both in the U.S. and it sounds like in Canada, um, this is acceptable behavior on the part of uh, the owners of these parks to allow um, these types of animals who are, you know, highly social, who have evolved uh, to be highly social, to live um, by themselves, which is uh, tragic. You see this too with elephants scattered across North America, living um, by themselves, highly social animals. So it's obviously a tragic situation. One of the things they do at Marineland is they actually warehouse animals. Have you heard anything about the situation where they keep dolphins and whales, um, even an orca named Junior, I've heard, uh, in, in, a, in a warehouse where they don't have access to sunlight or fresh air? Do you know anything about that situation? I, I only know just bits and pieces that I've read, and <clears throat> I'm skeptical of that because it seems so uh, outrageous that nobody would be involved in something like warehousing animals. and. Uh, those types of conditions so uh, unless I see it it's hard to imagine that something like that is true. Any speculation on what would be the point if that was going on like why they might want to do that? Well I mean what do you warehouse products for? You warehouse products to ship them around for distribution and so I can only imagine they're hoping to make a profit on uh, shipping these animals to whoever the, has the, the highest bid. Okay, so um, let's change the topic a little bit. And so, how sensitive would you say a dolphin or an orca skin would be? What do you What do you think? Like, how aware are they when you're touching them? What do they feel? Oh, they're totally sensitive. I mean, you know, this is how they make a living. They make a living by um, having you know, you know great tactile senses. And uh, you know, when you touch them, even with the lightest touch, they respond. So they're they're very sensitive. And what's the lifespan of, of an um, animal in captivity versus one in the wild? Maybe choose an example of a dolphin in the wild versus captivity and then an orca in the wild versus captivity. Well, most of uh, what Dr. Ventry and I have done is, uh, is analyze um, orca data. So I'm not really an authority on bottlenose dolphin longevity, so I'm going to uh, basically not comment on that because okay. I, I can't comment with any authority. Okay, well, you guys wrote a paper about specifically about killer whales that analyzed the data on the lifespan of killer whales, so, so let's talk about that. What is the lifespan that you guys found out of the killer whales in captivity versus in the wild? Yeah, well, so if you account for animals who are still alive, um, which is only fair, right? Some animals, such as tilicum, surprisingly, are um, pretty long-lived animals, especially for captivity. Um, we, what you see is that animals live, uh, basically, once they're in captivity, 
uh, less than 10 years, whether they're born in captivity or they're placed there um, from being collected in the wild. So they live less than 10 years on average, even accounting for those animals uh, statistically uh, who are still alive. Um, and uh, it's been said with some authority that uh, they live basically human lives in terms of longevity in the wild. So, you know, males 50 years. Um, I met an animal named Granny uh, when I was in the Pacific Northwest um, a couple of years ago. She's 99, probably now 101 or something. And uh, she was hanging out with her son Ruffles, who was 55. And so that gives you an idea of how long they live, uh, or they potentially live in the wild. And, and that's basically unheard of in captivity. So given that, what do you think about animals living in small concrete tanks? What does that actually do to their well-being? It, you know, it's, it's, it's really crazy. Um, I, I worked as an orca trainer, and, um, and I acknowledged immediately that if it didn't feel too good to see these animals basically floating motionless in these concrete tanks, uh, even if they wanted to swim, there's nowhere to go. Um, Tilikum, for example, his, his tail drags the bottom of the pool and all but a couple of the pools that he lives in. Um, and so what we're talking about in um, when we compare animals in captivity to those in the wild is a very impoverished life. They're impoverished uh, socially. Uh, they're not living with their family members as they do in, in the wild. And, um, and they're impoverished physically. There's nowhere to go. The spatial constraints are extreme. They live in a bathtub. And so um, while it's good for the bottom line for the companies who house them, it certainly uh, can't be good for the, the animals that live in these uh, bathtubs. And I'm, I'm sure that if you could ask the orcas, for that matter, any probably marine mammals that could speak back, they would tell you they would rather be in the ocean. I can only imagine. So what do you think about some of the their process for, for breeding killer whales? They use artificial insemination now to breed animals, to try to breed some uh, diversity into the population. Any thoughts on that, that procedure, or any thoughts about whether that's acceptable to use with killer whales? Yeah, well, if you look at the lineage uh, of, uh, the, for example, the animals that SeaWorld owns, um, the, uh, uh, the vast majority of offspring are sired by tilicum. Keep in mind, the tilikums killed uh, three people now. Um, and as my friend Sam Berg says uh, in uh, the movie Blackfish, you know, I don't think that anybody's even asked the question: Is this a good idea? Um, you know, to to breed these traits uh, in offspring that are in captivity. The offspring being that they have a propensity to to, uh, to attack and kill people. Um, that having been said, I guess artificial insemination is probably superior to trying to go out in the wild and collect animals. Um, and so um, I, it would be nice if we could, you know, come up with maybe a plan to uh, eliminate all types of breeding programs in, uh, in captivity. And certainly you know, it doesn't even need to be said that we need to stop collecting them from the wild. Do you know anything about that other whale in, in South America, Shemake, who's also being used for artificial insemination? I know very anything about, about that, that particular animal. I can't comment. So what, how much do you know about the water quality? Does SeaWorld use chlorine in their water? Are you uh, privy to that information anymore? Or when they were there, when you were there, did they use chlorine in the water? And do you know what it did to the animals? Well, <clears throat> that's a complex question. Um, we often saw animals um, who were sunburned, or at least appeared to be sunburned, with um, you know their their skin sloughing off uh, with, with what appeared to be uh, sunburn type symptoms, and so I naturally attributed it to you know just having no cover and being exposed to the Florida sun. Um, but SeaWorld does chlorinate their water. Um, I was told it has a, a very low um, uh, low chlorine content. Um, I always got the feeling that the water quality at SeaWorld was pretty good. They use an ozonation and ultraviolet radiation um, uh, disinfection, which is uh, it's actually pretty safe. Ozone is a gas and it's a, a strong oxidizer and uh, it volatilizes out of the water pretty quickly and of course ultraviolet radiation, once it's applied and turned off or the water passes through, there's no residual effect. It kills uh, viruses and bacteria and fungi um, purportedly. 
so I, I always got the feeling that the water quality was pretty good, and they keep the water at a, a, a nice chilled temperature, r roughly 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but uh, in terms of the chlorine, which is also a strong oxidizer and can make your skin slough off if you ever spent any time in a chlorinated pool, you'll know that. Um, I don't know exactly what, uh, what the concentration was. Um, I never experienced any uh, deleterious effects of uh, chlorinated water while I was there, but uh, it doesn't mean, you know, if you're uh, submerged in, in chlorinated water like the animals are 24-7, um, that it doesn't have some effect. But we did see sloughing skin as a regular part of, uh, of the day, which I attributed to sunburn. Did you ever see jaw popping while you worked at the Killer Whale Stadium, and could you explain for people what jaw popping is? Sure. I mean, that's a part of your um, everyday gig at, at uh, a place like SeaWorld, is seeing animals, um, what's been coined as jaw popping through the steel segregation gates that are used to segregate uh, or separate animals. And, uh, and the idea is kind of um, like uh, maybe in a bar fight where you, <clears throat> you, you see a, a guy who, you know, is not such a tough guy going after somebody else, and as soon as the bouncers move in, he's really tough, right? Because there's somebody to kind of block him and to kind of keep him from getting beat up. Well, as soon as you put bars or um, uh, obstacles between killer whales, they suddenly become pretty tough, and they often fight through the bars and the gates, and uh, in doing so, they, um, they oftentimes will break their teeth uh, while they're chomping at each other uh, on the steel bars that, that, uh, that make up the gate. And so, um, you know, it was not uncommon to uh, dive or scuba dive or snorkel the pools uh, below those gates and find teeth fragments. And at one time I carried a tooth fragment from um, one of the whales that we had, I think it was probably from Katina in my car, and I don't know where that tooth fragment is, but um, so jaw popping and actually social strife in general is very common. So how do you feel about it when people think of these animals that are at places like SeaWorld and Marine Land just purely as property? What's your opinion on that? Like something we own that we can do anything that we want with because they're ours and we can. One of the most striking uh, comments in Blackfish for me is uh, from uh, former trainer John Hargrove, who was a recent departure from SeaWorld, had a you know illustrious career, uh, twenty odd years or something. Um, he just left. He's in Blackfish, um, and John makes a statement that while we care for these orcas in captivity, we bring them their food, we give them their care every day. We don't own the whales. SeaWorld owns the whales. They own them. For me, it was a very salient moment when I first heard that line in, in, uh, in the documentary um, because it, it's interesting on several levels. One, that, yeah, you know, you, go, you have to go home at the end of the day and, and somebody else takes care of them or they float motionless at night or whatever, but kind of most, more importantly is that this concept that somebody actually does own them. You know, in their natural state, these animals have, you know, thousands of square miles to, to roam and they swim a hundred miles a day and they're owned by no one. And so um, to, to think of these animals as being owned was a, a real sort of light bulb moment for me. I never really thought of them that way. Um, and so I don't know what that means. And I don't know what it says, but um, it, it was a strong statement. You have a line in the movie where you talk about looking into their eyes and seeing that somebody's home. And so how do you have an opinion on how smart they are? Like, what would you compare them to in terms of their intelligence? What, what did you see from working with them? You know, I've always said that, that uh, orcas and, and cetaceans in general are from another planet. They evolved on a different planet. They evolved you know, in the water. Um, they have, you know, a lot uh, uh, more years of evolutionary history than, than, um, than Homo sapiens. And, and so they're, they're so highly evolved socially, physically, etc., that in some ways they really are from outer space. And so um, I, I do think though that they get it and I think they get their predicament and I think they understand certainly when um, things are awry and I think they understand clearly when their offspring are taken from them. And, um, and, and yeah, so it, it's, it's hard to describe what I think of their intelligence because I think their intelligence is so different than our own. 
that uh, it's an apples to orange comparison. So how much do you know about the, the um, non-human rights project and do you have any sense on when you think animals like killer whales might have civil rights put in place? Is that something that might be coming in the near future? You know, our country, um, <clears throat> I can't speak for Canada, but Canada seems to be following the same model as to, unfortunately, a lot of other countries, is that in, in, in the U.S. we have a very uh, utilitarian sense of natural resources. And so, you know, that's how our country got started, is that we moved in and we took what, uh, you know, we thought we needed. And um, nothing stood in our way, including the Native Americans here. Um, and including, you know, forests, vast forests, including, you know, millions and millions and millions of bison. Uh, we slaughtered them for our own take. And, um, and, and so I think this, this idea uh, is, is really interesting, and it's one that I hope we evolve towards. I don't know, given the business model of, um, you know, of growth at all costs that we have, in, at least in our country, that um, that we're ready to embrace that uh, in in wholesale fashion, but man, that's what we need, and so I'm hoping that we we begin moving in that direction. Anything in particular that you've learned specifically being involved in Blackfish, the movie, either something about orcas that you didn't know before, or anything that you've learned about animals in captivity, or any eye-opening moments from being part of this movie? You know, for me. Um, and I already knew this, but it was just an affirmation of uh, there's so many bright, talented, well-spoken, well-meaning people involved in uh, this issue of cetacean and other captivity um, that I have hope for um, the future. And so Blackfish is going to be uh, one of these uh, benchmarks, and I think it's going to be referenced for years and years and years. And I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so that's my hope, is that this is going to sort of open an honest dialogue that until recently has never occurred. And just to get the statistics down, how many people have been killed in captivity by orcas and how many people have been attacked or killed in the wild by orcas? So what, at least four have been killed um, and, I, you know, who knows how many have been attacked. I mean, every trainer that spent any time in the water has had what we would call incidents, um, which may or may not go into the official record. So some of these incidents um, certainly could have escalated into major accidents or deaths. And, um, and so probably what's on record or what's available through YouTube and the internet is just a small fraction of, uh, of, of what has actually occurred. And I think if you talk to any trainer who has spent time with, with the orcas, uh, or for that matter, probably dolphins, um, they'd probably tell you the same thing, that uh, these, these things are part of the, the daily occurrence. Any speculation on why we see so many of these things in captivity and it rarely occurs in the wild? Or never? Well, <clears throat> first of all, in the w to be fair, in the wild, you don't work closely with them. So the, the probability of you know, having these incidents at a regular interval um, is, is just naturally going to be lower in, in the wild. Um, but it's easy to see how these things happen in captivity. I mean, um, if you just take Tilikum, for example, and I work a lot with Tilikum, and, um, you know, I thought I knew Tilikum pretty well, but Tilikum's life is basically floating completely bored at the surface of the water, probably 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day. Uh, and when he's put with other animals, he gets beat up and chased. Uh, Tilikum's teeth are... Uh, in very bad shape. He's got to be in pain. Um, he's very old by um, captivity standards, especially for a male. And so I can imagine that, given the frustrations of, of this, his confinement, that it's it's um, it's understandable that he would, you know, look at uh, a situation as novel and uh, and pursue it. And in which case, you know, like for example, Don Branchow. Once he got Don's arm in his mouth, he realized that this might be a little bit of fun. It's a diversion from a very boring life, and so why not? So it's easy to see why these things happen. So when was the first time you saw a killer whale in the wild, and how did you feel seeing the animals in the wild? And was this before or after you worked with them in captivity? Uh, unfortunately, and I would guess is the case for the vast majority of trainers that work with orcas, um, for me, it was uh, much later uh, after I finished working with orcas that I saw them in the wild. It was uh, 
in, in 2011, and I'm embarrassed to say that. Uh, but I will tell you this, um, I went home or went to the hotel that, that night and uh, I, I simply just cried and um, it was a rough go for me. It's pretty intense it to see them in the wild after you've worked with them in captivity yeah. and you know what you're actually doing. You can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and my good friend Sam Berg said that, you know, when you see them in the wild, you realize that that's where they're supposed to be. And so it's, and I knew that, of course, we all know that. Uh, but when you see them uh, traveling in their natural habitat, it, uh, you know, it's one of those moments um, that, that tweaks your brain, it changes your neural patterns. And, um, and for me, it was a, um, you know, a very um, surreal experience because the guys in the wild are nothing like the guys in captivity. And so, you know, uh, it was a completely different animal that I saw. Is there anything that you think we can learn about watching orcas or killer whales in captivity that we don't already know when there's really no natural behaviors going on? Is there some, what, is there some saving grace to captivity at this point that you would speak to? Well, <clears throat> you know, orcas have been in captivity for a long time and, um, you know, SeaWorld, to their credit, did some research early on and they found out how to best keep them alive, how much how many calories they needed a day, uh, um, you know, and, and then, you know, what gestation periods were, and, and uh, so, you know, if you go through the research uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, SeaWorld is publishing very little research. There's virtually nothing being done um, and, and that's scientific, that's valid science, um, from places like SeaWorld. And so I think what we've learned is all we're going to learn from uh, the animals in captivity. And so I would say kudos to SeaWorld and places like SeaWorld for learning sort of, you know, this basic, uh, basic uh, material that we learned early on. But uh, it's, it's clear that it's time to, to move on. Did you get to watch whales with Ingrid Visser at any point? Have you met her? No. Okay. So you're part of a group of ex-trainers called Voice of the Orcas on the internet. Can you say anything about what Voice of the Orcas is and what their goals are? Well, Voice of the Orcas really is uh, the brainchild of Dr. Ventry and, and, uh, and Sam Berg and Carol Ray and, and others um, contribute regularly to the, the website. And, and I see uh, Voice of the Orcas being a sort of clearinghouse for um, former trainers, ex-trainers, to, um, to, to, to state what's going on and to try to give some insight and, um, and, and angles as to, to what's going on with, the, with captive orcas. It's also a place to, to where, warehouse uh, some of the, the materials that we're writing and, 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 and publishing. And so uh, that's kind of how I see um, the, the voice of the orcas. Anything else that you would want to say to the audience that we didn't ask? Anything that you think people should know about captive killer whales or your role? And working with captive captive killer whales, or where you think things should go now that this movie is getting out there, now that blackfish is starting to be seen by people. Well, this is the thing. I mean, uh, it, it, the the question is, so what? So we're seeing blackfish, and blackfish is going to be released this summer, and it's terrific. It's it's honest and it's accurate. It's going to really start a dialogue. And so I think it is incumbent upon all of us to, to try to figure out, you know, uh, what's next and what's what's really the the best alternative for the animals that are in captivity? Do we retire them to a sea pen? Um, do we somehow put downward pressure in terms of gate attendance on places like SeaWorld? Um, I think that's, uh, that's something that we, we need to, to discuss a little bit further, but uh, I can tell you one thing, after working with the animals and after looking at the objective evidence it, 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 and the evidence is suggesting strongly that it doesn't work out for the animals. And so if you don't care about the animals, then that's fine. You can continue, you know, selling Shamu dolls and uh, taking gate attendance uh, money and, and, and it works out great for you. But if you do care about other critters, especially smart ones, um, then uh, I think it, it behooves all of us to ask these hard questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Jett. Thank you, John. Can you edit